Hey guys, how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at CFA Level 1 and 2 Big Data Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Learning Outcome Statements for the CFA exams. My name is Benjamin Ricard, and one of the things I'm passionate about is helping people like you who may not be experts at computer science or mathematics able to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence tools to their analytics to step up their research to the next level. If you're interested, check out the rest of my channel for more. So for the level one outcome statement, they're essentially asking you just on a very broad level to define big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So this idea of big data is essentially exactly what it sounds like. We live in this age now where we're just constantly creating new data faster than we can actually analyze it. And the volume of it is just so, so big. Um, and furthermore, I think the real kind of key that they might actually ask you about is this idea that it's unstructured. So when we had been thinking about data in the past and statistics, we've been thinking about um, sort of data that was nicely structured in columns and rows, uh, but that might not necessarily have all the information we're interested in. Um, when we could get, you know, news articles will come out, uh, press releases from companies, all these sorts of uh, sources of data that we can actually understand using artificial intelligence uh, that we can't use using uh, traditional approaches. And so this idea of big data is kind of this new age of the way we're looking at data. And so for machine learning and AI, they essentially, I think, want you to know um, Basically, just on a very broad general level, how they're kind of related. So I'm just going to start out by saying a couple things. I think if you're studying for the CFI level one, first of all, watch the end of this video just to get a better idea of what would go on in level two. And also, I think it would help your answer for level one. And second of all, just also look at a couple more resources just to make sure uh, you get all the depths. This is kind of very subjective and broad. So you want to make sure you get everything that they would talk about. Uh, but as far as I understand that, that, I made sure to put everything that I think that they would put on their test. Uh, but this idea of machine learning is this. Uh, essentially this new philosophy of how we think about data and this idea that we have data and we have some goal and we do whatever we can to get to that goal. And if you're thinking this sounds very similar to statistics, you're actually right. It's kind of just statistics with a lot more steps and the kind of more uh, direct approach. I think in statistics, there's more emphasis placed on the like properties of your model and kind of how you want it to you want your model to be a certain way. But in machine learning, the only thing you care about is performance. And that's literally the only thing that's important. And so this idea of, you know, you have just this unstructured data, you have some task, and you try to figure out how to get there using different algorithms. I would say that that would pretty much be machine learning. And for artificial intelligence, I think that what they want you to understand is essentially saying um, this idea that we can go from very complex representations like images or 10Q text to actually just getting some finite result at the end of the day. And so it's this idea of this end-to-end -end from the very sort of like, you know, data that, that is just data as it is to our answer that we want. And so that intelligence is from going from those two things, essentially. So next, we're actually going to talk about the CFA level one learning outcome statements. And the first thing that you're going to talk about, and this should really be the easy questions that you should get right, because this is not difficult at all compared to a lot of the other stuff that would be on the test. But this idea of unsupervised or supervised machine learning. And so when you hear this, you should immediately think to yourself, labeled or unlabeled? What I mean by that is uh, a given problem can pretty much be defined on what the supervised or unsupervised based on if it has a label or not. And so if I, for example, if I give you a bunch of Twitter profiles and I just say, I don't tell you any other information, I just say, these are just Twitter profiles. Uh, you might think of a couple of un unsupervised ways to deal with them. You could cluster them. You could figure out the most common words. You could do these sorts of analysis um, based on, you know, the big set of data. You can figure out things like relationships to, to different, you know, categories or whatever or to different profiles. Uh, but if I tell you a different question, I say, well, now half of these profiles are following McDonald's and half of these are following Burger King. So figure out some way to understand their customer differences. Now that becomes a labeled supervised problem because essentially I'm, I'm telling you that this extra information besides the data that you are planning probably should use to train your model to predict McDonald's or Burger King. Um, and so again, if you think about things like clustering or dimension reductions, uh, which we're going to go into a little bit more in a, a later in a second. Um, this idea that you don't really have these sort of labels for that. You just have the data itself. So these are considered unsupervised algorithms because you're not training on some extrinsic label. And so just to summarize, so if you know you have data, but you don't know anything about your outcome, so in other words, you just have just your data, it's probably going to be do something unsupervised. If you do have data and you do have something of your outcome and you want to use that um, knowledge of the outcome, then you're probably going to have some supervised metric. So 
I need you to like and comment and subscribe to this to actually make YouTube look at this like a supervised data. So in other words, if you actually, right now it just looks at this video as a video, but with your like, it will actually make it say that, say that you actually like this and will actually add that extra level of labeling that will allow this video to actually be used in supervised algorithms. So that would help me out and that would help you get a better example of supervised data for YouTube. So the next thing we're gonna be looking at is description steps and model training. And so this idea of machine learning really at the point at the end of the day is to have a good performance on data that we haven't seen before yet. And so if you think about the most naive approach, if I give you a large data set and I say train a model, uh, what you might do and what I mean, what essentially statistics has done for a while is essentially just training on the entire data and then evaluating on that same data. Uh, but we come to this issue called overfitting. And this is a really important term that I would be sure to know um, look up, look up, and kind of really know what overfitting is. So I think it's going to be very important for the test. Uh, but just as a brief description, it's essentially this idea of memorizing data. So if I these models that are super powerful that can compute, you know, a large, large uh, sample, it's very easy for one of these models to literally just memorize the input data. So in other words, if you're you have some even a big amount of training data, if you just keep on feeding it the same information to train it, which is what you need to do to train it. Uh, you're essentially you can just your model can just memorize that exact same input and then always give that same output and the issue comes in is if you're trying to actually evaluate your model how do you actually do that because you're essentially biased your model's result and it's not actually telling you how good it would be at applying to unseen data it's only telling you how good it is on the data that it's seen before so you need to resist overfitting and not overfit so that you are able to actually generalize the things outside of the set that you're training on and so the solution to this is one way that they use this is they they essentially train on a smaller subset of data. So they'll take like 75% or 80% of the data and train it on that. And they fine tune it based on the results from a 10% and then they'll test it finally on another 10%. So as a depiction of this, so think about if we have, this is our naive approach. We just have the, the entire data set. And if we just decide to train on that approach and that's just gonna be a biased approach because essentially we can just memorize our data. Um, so, what we can do instead is actually using this sort of depiction so you can see the training set, the validation set, and the testing set, which we're gonna use for training, for fine tuning, and for evaluating the model. Uh, so if we split the data set like this and actually apply it, we can, we can use a proper machine learning training procedure, we can actually get this unbiased estimate of what a generalized error would be. And so here's like just a simple training procedure, what procedure like what would you use for a neural network or something? You would say you would train on some smaller subset of data you would check your performance on your validation data and you would keep on training a little bit and then test and then check your performance, train a little bit and then check your performance. And you essentially just repeat that until you converge or until your model stops training. So then at the end of the day, you have a bunch of models that you created for each time point based on this validation set. So you just take the best one and that's the model that you apply to your testing set. So you can see how we're training, we're only seeing this model, but then we apply, we check the performance on our validation set. And then after we finally find the best model, the one that had the best performance on the validation set, we can apply that to the test set to actually get our final model. Just if you want to just think about the kind of logic of why we do it this way and why we need these three different data sets. And then you can kind of understand what they're asking you about for this training procedure question. So finally, we're just going to talk about some common machine learning algorithms that are used in prediction, classification, clustering, and dimension reduction. So the first other thing we're going to talk about is regression. So regression is used for prediction, as you would know, for a linear regression, as you might know, um, and also used for classification in the case of logistic regression. So these are both supervised methods. I'm not going to go too much into these because I'm assuming that most people have at least some grasp of a regression, uh, but I will do a video, a, a review, and there's going to be a link in the description here. Um, but regressions are actually subject to this idea of overfitting if the number of variables in your regression model is too large. And this kind of is an occurrence with big data. Um, so we actually add this term called the regularization or effect or regularization term to actually prevent overfitting. And you can use sort of the same sort of machine learning uh, training procedure, the validation testing and training uh, procedure in order to actually get, get the best model and have a, a generalized error using these regression techniques. So the next thing that we're going to talk about that I've seen commonly kind of discurred in uh, occurred in um, CFA material is this idea of k-means clustering or hierarchical clustering. So if you think, if you hear clustering, just think unsupervised because the idea of, again, clustering and unsupervised is essentially given the data, we want to figure out how it clusters together. 
And that's implying that you don't really have any other information that you want to use um, to cluster these. So you just want to use the data itself. And so um, I, I'm just going to go a little bit more in detail into k-means because this is one of the ones that they might mention might be important. So this idea is that we initially define some k-means. So we choose k to be some number. In my example, I'm going to choose two. And then we randomly place our two cluster centers anywhere on the map and on the graph. And then for each step, we reevaluate these cluster centers based on the centroid. And hopefully this will make it a little easier. So if I have essentially this some random data and you can kind of see that there's like two sort of clusters here. And this is all kind of subjective. So that might not quantitatively work out, but this is more or less how it should work. Um, so this idea is that, um, well, this one is the, these two points are closest to the red and the rest of the points are closest to the yellow. So that's why we label these points. So just we just randomly initialize, the, put those uh, two centroids. And then, so now knowing that, we actually move the centroids to be the center of the get, or the move the guesses to be the middle of the centroids, essentially. So now we know that since these two are red, it's going to be right here. And since all of these, I just kind of said that that was here. It might have been a little bit wrong or something. But we essentially, we'll repeat that and we'll, we'll gradually move the centers uh, and then recalculate the centers based on whatever the labels are until the model doesn't move anymore and it won't, and it'll just converge to this and it'll have something that looks like this. Uh, so you can see that this is highly dependent on your initial guesses on the number of Ks. Uh, but again, this is an unsupervised algorithm because we're starting out without any label information on our data set. So next I'm going to talk about really fascinating uh, field, in my opinion, neural networks. And these can be used for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I think mostly for the CFA, if you see neural network, you really should think prediction or classification. There are a class of neural networks called autoencoders, which do dimension reduction, uh, which are unsupervised. Uh, but most other neural networks are supervised and they're either prediction or classification. And so given this idea of all neural networks is given some really well-defined data, and like an image or a, a, a text or something like that, you need to learn to predict a given value. So essentially that's part of the the supervised procedures, you need to have that class um, in order to actually train these model. And so this is actually from a very famous uh, neural network paper. It's called AlexNet. And so this is, I know, a really complicated picture, uh, but I think I just want to point out that the image, so they start out with a 224, 224 uh, by three, so the RGB image. So these are images and they're predicting each one of these images as one of two, as one as 1,000 options. And so you see they have a, a well-defined output as the 1,000 options. And then they have the input as the size 224, 224, and they have a bunch of stuff between. And this idea that these neural networks, you can kind of see that the, how this would be a supervised method because uh, we know we're given some label and we use that label to actually learn all these weights through the entire network. So next up, I just want to briefly talk about random forests. So these are used for classification and prediction and they are supervised. And so this idea is that essentially you just have a training, a, a, a series of really simple models based on subsets of the data and you combine those models together uh, to get a bigger, large model. And this idea is called an ensemble uh, model. And so there's other kinds of common examples of ensemble models called boosting and bagging. I'm not going too much into detail because I don't know if this will be on the CFA. But what I do know will be on there is dimension reduction. This is one of the things that they actually mentioned. So this part is probably very important. And so the idea of dimension reduction is essentially you want to compress your image to a smaller representation. So given some handwriting uh, data, if you have a bunch of pictures of people writing digits, um, this autoencoder, which is a complex kind of neural network, will actually train a layer, a bunch of layers that will encode the, the information, the handwriting image into a single uh, vector that's you know very small like this. It's very binary, easy to understand, compressed representation. And then essentially you can get this reconstructed output out of it. And, and so this idea is that if we can figure out a way to represent these input images into a smaller dimension easier, we can actually do things like understand um, you know, with greater resolution, greater context, and greater depth. Um, so it's actually useful to use dimension reduction um, to, to, if we want to increase the power of our models while not uh, removing some parts of the data, essentially. And so there's two examples of this PCA or, or PCA and autoencoders. Um, and so these are considered unsupervised because even though I kind of, you can kind of consider them as labeled because they're if you look at it, it's 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 labeled on itself. So these train the way that these neural networks train. That's how they're able to actually train like neural networks is because the label is just the original input image. Um, and so, 
But even though they, they are labeled with themselves, it is just themselves. So it is just unsupervised. And some other examples would be like TSNE or UMAP. So I've gotten a couple of uh, practice questions from the link in the description. And first one, characteristic of big data is, uh, well, one of its traditional sources is business processes, not necessarily true. I think it's a lot of you know, social media as we were talking about. Um, it does involve format with diverse types of structures. And I think that this is, remember, again, keep in mind that this sort of idea of unstructured text is kind of able to be understood by this big data and artificial intelligence. It may not be data in the sense of a very structured table, but it is still how we think of data. Um, and real-time communication is common, so that's not true as well. So the answer is B. Um, and so for number two, in the use of machine learning, some techniques are termed black box due to data biases. Um, and so actually this is not true, is even though some techniques are termed black boxes, not due to data biases, due to like data procedure or training procedure. Um, I think you can understand this because there's a better uh, answer here, so we'll keep going. So human judgment is not needed because algorithms continuously learn from data. Um, I still think that there's still some form of human judgment that, I mean, I never said that, need, I think you think you'll still need to know the judgment on inputs and outputs, essentially what you need to get from the output. And, uh, but C is definitely true. Training data can be learned too precisely resulting in inaccurate predictions and use different data. So this is describing exactly overfitting. Uh, again, one of those very important uh, terms and kind of uh, uh, aspects that you should know about machine learning uh, for the CFA exam. So just as a review, make sure you look over overfitting, underfitting. If you're overfitting, it means you're mem essentially memorizing the data. If I gave you a practice test that was identical to the, the practice test and you just memorized it, you'd be fine. But if I gave you a test that was actually different than the practice test, you might not do so well. Um, that's the idea of overfitting. Uh, supervised, unsupervised, just think labeled or unlabeled. And make sure you go through over through the parts where I mentioned about training, validation, and test and understand why we need those three data sets. And I think you'll be all set. Good luck. Thank you.